powers of perception. In another of his conversations, he explained that any state of awareness that involves an unusual position of the assemblage point is technically a dream. He said that the advantage of dreams over everyday states of attention is that they allow us to cover a wider sensory perspective and spectrum and to better synthesize the information we receive. In other words, we learn how to live with more intensity. The result, greater clarity in our perceptual progress. Above all, he said, dreaming gives us access to critical events in our past, such as our birth and our early childhood, and it illuminates traumatic situations and alters states of awareness in our past. A sorcerer cannot leave aside his most harrowing experiences. Towards the end of his lecture, he gave a definition that I considered very important because he touched on what I felt was a sensitive topic. He said, Dreaming is not something impossible. It's just a kind of deep meditation. For years, I had been doing something spiritual. Correction. For years, I had been doing some spiritual exercises called meditation. These practices were quite different from what Carlos was proposing, both regarding their form and their results. As soon as I had an opportunity, I asked him to clarify the distinctions between the concept of dreaming and meditation. He answered, What you're asking is difficult because there is no way of meditating without dreaming. Both terms describe the same phenomenon. Then why haven't my exercises produced any of the things you talk about? You had better answer that yourself. In my opinion, what you have practiced up to now has not been meditation, but some kind of auto-suggestion. It is common for people to confuse both things that, for a sor sorcerer, are not the same. Pacifying the mind is not meditation, but drowsiness. On the other hand, dreaming is something dynamic. It is the consequence of a process of sustained concentration which implies a veritable battle against our lack of attention. If it were just the result of a dulling of the senses, practitioners would not call themselves warriors. A dreamer can be the very incarnation of ferocity or seem profoundly calm, but none of that has any real importance because he does not identify himself with his mental states. He knows that any definite situation is nothing but a fixation of the assemblage point. Dreaming happens when we achieve a certain balance in our daily life and only after silencing the internal dialogue. The term dreaming is not the most appropriate to describe an exercise of awareness which has nothing to do with the content of the mind. I use it out of respect for the tradition of my lineage, but the ancient seers called it something else. Export, expert sorcerers dream starting from their state of vigil as easily as from sleeping, because for them it is not about to close the eyes and snore, but to witness other worlds which are out there. From the point of view of will, what distinguishes a dream from a daytime vigil of a sorcerer is that the energy body obeys other laws. He can carry out incredible feats like passing through a wall or moving to the ends of the universe in a blink of an eye. Such experiences are complete and accumulative, and only somebody who has not lived them himself would cling to logical categories to explain them. But that kind of manifestation, however valuable, are not the objective of dreaming. The dream is essential for you because access to the Nagual happens almost exclusively in that state. I asked him, why is this so? He answered, the reason is evident. People who have a natural tendency to dream and a surplus of energy qualify to find other, more advanced dreamers, either accidentally or because they deliberately look for them. Occasionally, these traveling companions accept to take charge of instructing them more deeply in the art. Once an apprentice begins to shine, it is inevitable that he will attract the attention of a Nagual. Nagwals are like eagles, constantly stalking. As soon as they detect an increment of awareness, they swoop in, because a voluntary dreamer is a rarity. For a teacher, it is much easier to stimulate an effort that has already begun than creating one from nothing. Carlos told me that he maintained contact with many warriors from various parts of the world through dreaming. He went on to say that another reason why dreaming is a door 
to knowledge is that its practice allows you to resolve a thousand problems derived from learning. Like the lack of clarity and attention in a beginner, his mistrust regarding his instructor's activities and the intrinsic danger of some of the techniques. This art softens the obsessive nature of the emanations of the eagle, which could otherwise destroy the psychological balance and the will of the apprentice. Then I asked him, what can those of us who don't dream do in order to gain access to these teachings? He seemed bothered by my question. He grunted. You have the wrong focus. The true question would be, what should I do to dream? A warrior cannot walk around in the world leaving those loose ends with every step. If you genuinely cannot consider your dreams a part of your life, if you cannot visualize them as what they are, avenues of power, if you do not even understand what they are or what purpose they serve, well, then you have a lot of work before you.